election. Uh, I, I have said in this house before that you could sometimes mistake the Prime Minister for wanting to become a Premier instead of a Prime Minister, given with all the meddling in provincial jurisdiction that he's been doing over the f first uh, last number of years, but I'd like uh, the Honourable Member to mention that. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank my Honourable colleague, with whom I really enjoy discussing. As for his question, this is uh, an excellent way to continue the answer that I was giving earlier. Even with the system uh, that we have in Quebec, the federal government keeps trying to impose conditions. It's extremely paternalistic. When we're asking for our own money back to do what we think we need, we're being asked to obey conditions in exchange. It is not all right for the federal government to constantly interfere in what the provinces decide. The provinces have every right to decide for themselves about certain programs, especially where their money can go. Provinces are different. They have different priorities. Why don't we leave more decision-making power with the provinces, especially with Quebec, which is a whole other country? We're still dealing with two solitudes. Thank you. Questions and comments? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to extend many thanks to my colleague for her excellent speech. I have a question for the economist that she is. In the budget, there's the whole issue of housing. At the Finance Committee last year, the chair was saying that to solve the crisis, we needed to increase the supply. In the budget, we see help people access property. Many economists are saying, however, that this measure is counterproductive, and I'd like to hear my colleague on that. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne. Thank you very much to my dear colleague for his question. Indeed, the overheated housing market is different in many cities. We don't have the same problem in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, or regions in Quebec. Using a single measure to try and meet the challenges throughout the entire country is already a bad idea. But even worse, there is a problem of supply. There's a very high occupancy rate. Providing measures for a section of a segment of the population that's already able to save, this measure is for people who already can put money aside to buy a house and is going to stimulate demand even more, which is counterproductive. Thank you. Resuming debate, the President of the Debat. The Deputy of Longueuil, Saint Hubert, and I think you have about seven minutes. I think you have about seven minutes. Très content de prendre la parole sur cette. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to rise to speak to Bill C-19. There's a lot of things. We've talked about it, but it is a shame that we are limited in our time of debate. We will never criticize them enough. Liberals are against debates. We saw during the election campaign we had important bills that needed to be voted on. They decided to call an election. Everything went back to square one. There were bills that basically had to go back to square one. Two years ago, they prorogued the House. And now we have this mammoth bill that doesn't even include all of the budgetary measures, just part of them. So I'm going to focus on the part that I'm interested in the most. I think everybody knows in this house that I've gotten up about a billion times to talk about the housing crisis. In fact, Mr. Speaker, there's four significant crises going on in Canada. There's the language crisis. My colleague for Salaberry sur Wap, table de bell. My colleague for Pointe de Lille is very committed to defending the French language in Quebec, just as I am, and everybody at the Bloc Québécois. It's important. There is a significant linguistic crisis happening in the country, and the federal government refuses to recognize that there's no equality between the status of the French language and that of the English language. It's a big problem. And there is the public health crisis. We're slowly getting out of it. We're glad to see it. We hope that the consequences, which uh, are going to be significant, will be manageable, even if the federal government said it sent money during the crisis, one-time payments to help with the health care system throughout the country. It refuses the constant request put forward by every single province to increase health transfers 
from 22 to 35 percent, which could actually help to pay for the next crisis. We're talking about organizations. We're talking with organizations on the ground, and there's another crisis coming: the mental health crisis that's going to cost us. One day, the federal government is going to have to understand that health is a under provincial jurisdiction, and it's not up to them to set standards. The provinces who manage hospitals pay the doctors. They're the ones who manage the system. They're the ones who know their needs. They're the ones who need the money. And the money is here in Ottawa. The other crisis we're going through right now is the climate crisis. And there's a connection with the main subject that I want to raise today, which is the housing crisis, which is what I talk about the most in this place, the climate crisis. The government, when it comes to the housing crisis, acts like acts in a similar way with the climate crisis. In a month, the federal government increased targets, which were about 30 percent in the budget before last. But in the last budget, they said, we're never going to reach these targets. We'll increase it to 36 percent. And then they went up to 36 percent. Oh, but there's still no measure to get there. We don't know how they're going to get there, but 36 percent. And then on Earth Day, they increased it somewhere to 40 to 45 percent. Still no measure to get there. No measure that says how we're going to get there. And they just throw numbers out at us. And now, in the meantime, one billion barrels of oil over 30 years, the Project Bezna. Canada has never, never, ever ever, 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 never, in all of its history, never, never hit a single greenhouse gas reduction target. It's never happened in its entire history. And now we've got 40 to 45 percent. Well, it's, uh, Ridiculous. And let's go back to housing. When it comes to housing, the government is basically making the same kind of bets, is throwing out all kinds of numbers and is crossing their fingers and closing their eyes and clenching and hoping they'll achieve their target. In the budget, we're talking about, in Canada, that we need 3.5 million housing units to face the crisis we're currently experiencing. 3.5 million. Where did they get that number, first of all? I think they got it out of, out of a study in a few... Uh, we saw a study a few months ago that we needed 1.7, and the Liberals must have said, now that we've got a budget, they must have said, well, you know, up to 2031, Immigration targets are high, 1.7 million. Well, we've got about 300,000 people coming in per year. That means we're going to need 3.5 million units. But in the budget, in the budget, there's a failure. Oh, I've uh, got uh, some questions to answer for five minutes. Okay. In the budget, there's an admission of failure because there was 3.5 million, but they don't say, just like with climate change, how we're going to get there. There's a few programs. There's a few numbers. There's a few amounts to face this crisis. But let's look at the housing accelerator with municipalities, which is a big problem in and of itself. It's already a scandal. Municipalities are the creation of the provinces. And the federal government is saying, we're going to take this money and we're going to send it to Matane, to Rimouski, to Quebec, to Longueuil, to Val Valleyfield, bypassing Quebec. We're going to have to talk about Quebec in there somewhere. The last time we tried to negotiate with Quebec, it took three years, three years. And during that time, they were spending money in Toronto and Vancouver and Winnipeg, but nothing in Quebec, nothing. I apologize to the member. I warned you that you had five minutes before a question period. Unfortunately, it's already done. You will have three minutes and 27 seconds when we resume after question period.
Declaration de députés. Statements by members. By members, the honourable member for Calgary Skyview. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, for the last few years, the University of Calgary has been collaborating with the Sikh Sangat in the city to raise money for a Sikh Studies program. Many of the residents from my riding of Calgary Skyview have contributed to this initiative. The Sikh Studies program consists of an instructorship in Sikh Studies, additional courses, a postdoctoral research fellowship, a Sikh Studies community advisory group, and a library fund for Sikh literature. The university and stakeholders are still collecting donations for the program's endowment. Thank you to the Sangat, who has and will donate. I want to thank the Gurdwaras, including the Dishmesh Cultural Center, the Sikh Society of Calgary, Guru Ram Das Darbar, Darbar Siri Guru Granth Sahib for their leadership. Thank you to the University of Calgary for providing a home to Canada's first Sikh Studies program. Finally, a special thank you to the MP from Surrey Newton for joining me to raise money for the program. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halliburton, Kawartha Lakes, Brock. Here, here, here. Speaker, earlier this month, residents of Kawartha Lakes felt the loss of two prominent historians and authors. Bev Ewan grew up working at his family's convenience store in Kirkfield, delivering milk to try to get himself through university to complete his teaching degree. After retiring from the Durham District School Board, Ved volunteered with the K Kirkfield Historical Society, acting as the editor and publisher of their regular newsletter, as well as managing the Society's website and other newsletters. Bev was a regular speaker at local events and will be remembered by generations of children as Santa Claus at the Kirkfield Museum's Christmas concert each year. In an interesting parallel, Dr. Ray Fleming also grew up in a general store in Argyle. In fact, after completing his PhD in Canadian history, Dr. Fleming went on to write many books, including one entitled General Stores of Canada. Throughout his career, Dr. Fleming was a lecturer at various universities and was a research associate at Trent University's Frost Centre for Canadian and Indigenous Studies. Both men were pillars in the community and will be greatly missed by many. The Honourable Member for Halifax West. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate a now iconic Canadian from my riding of Halifax West, Matea Roach. Matea first appeared on Jeopardy back on April 5th, and for more than a month, she dazzled viewers with her knowledge about everything from Belgian kings to Nova Scotian duck tolling retrievers. Through her 23 winning performances, she became the first Canadian Jeopardy! Super Champion. But what shone through most about Matea was her warmth and kindness. She's a role model for women, youth, members of the LGBTQ community, and indeed, everyone who knows the value of knowledge, no matter how obscure it may be. I know my community and all Canadians will be cheering her on in the Tournament of Champions in November, and none as loudly as her proud parents, Patty and Phil. Join me in congratulating Matea and wishing her success in her Jeopardy journey and in law school. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Berthier Masquinange. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to underscore the 35 years of commitment today in the pharmaceutical agriculture sector of Michel Daisy. He have worked with the, with the Union of Agricultural Producers for many years, and as the Vice President of the Union, he has worked for many years and been part of the developmental plan for the development of farmlands and also worked as a knight of the Chevalier de Bertin Masquinanger. I would like to tip my hat to him for all the work he has done and wish him the best in his retirement. Mr. Daisy, thank you for your contribution and for your passion. The Honourable Member for Bourassa. Mr. Speaker, on the occasion of Mother's Day, I would like to extend my best wishes to all women and to highlight in particular the resilience of the seniors who are paying a heavy price for the COVID-19 pandemic in Borassa. Our seniors are affected the most 
by isolation from their loved ones. And it is with great enthusiasm that my team and myself have begun for the first time in a week in person, uh, Mother's Day celebrations. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the leaders and members of the senior clubs and seniors' residences, as well as the organizations working in this county, to bring seniors uh, out of isolation and contribute to their well-being. Thank you, and happy Mother's Day to the various communities that make up our great country. Thank you. Well, the, the Honourable Member for Bay of Quinte. Mr. Speaker, Mother's Day is a day to be celebrated. I spent this last weekend in gratitude and celebration of the women in my life. I am blessed to have an incredible grandmother, Audrey, with us. She has been always a pillar of strength for my family. My wonderful mother, Heather, and my wife, Allison, who make sure our children know they're always loved and supported unconditionally. Mother's Day is a, a celebration, but for some it often comes with mixed emotions, including grief. Grief from a mother passing or a relationship being estranged, infertility and longing for the opportunity to be a mom, or the heaviness that comes from losing a child of your own. I think the hardest job in the world is mothering a child you can no longer hold. I want to thank all the moms for everything you do, and I want you to know if grief or mixed feelings accompanied you this Mother's Day, you aren't alone and we see you. Let's celebrate these amazing women this whole week, this whole year, truly and truly know that they deserve more than just one day. Yeah. 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 The Honourable Member for Nepean. Mr. Speaker, Asian Heritage Month is an opportunity to recognize the contributions Canadians of Asian heritage have made and continue to make to the socio-economic, political, and cultural heritage of Canada. I organized Asian Heritage Month celebration on the Parliament Hill yesterday with about 500 people attending and performances from 10 diaspora groups. I would like to thank the volunteer team led by my friend Karanakar Reddy Papala, fondly known as KK. Team included Bangladeshi Canadian Shah Bahauddin, Cambodian Canadian Uthi Le, Chinese Canadian Alex Ho, Iranian Canadian Alma Rahmani, Pakistani Canadian Dr. Saeed Aziz, Sri Lankan Canadian Anura Ferdinand, Taiwanese Canadian Tony Fan, Tamilian Canadian Shivarubhan Shivalingam, Vietnamese Canadian Can Le, also Jesse Shea, Monica Gupta, Puneet Agarwal, Riyaz Zaman, and Suvir Part Chaudhary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Toronto, Danforth. At the age of five, my daughter signed up to play hockey, and she was able to do that because of the leadership of a Greek Canadian athlete, Abby Hoffman. In 1956, when she was nine years old, she wanted to play hockey. She cut her hair short, registered as Ab Hoffman, and excelled. But when they discovered she was a girl, her hockey career ended. Later, Abby discovered her love for running. She represented Canada at the Olympics and Pan Am Games and won medals for Canada as a runner. But to do that, she also once again had to break through barriers. She actually opened up Heart House, which was only open to men until that time, to women as well, so that they could run and play sports as well. She continues to fight to this day for women in sports. Next week, she's going to be inducted into Ontario's Hall of Fame. Thank you, Abby, for your leadership. Congratulations from all Canadian girls and happy Canadian Jewish Heritage Month. You're a big part of our wonderful heritage. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On June 4th, we will celebrate National Range Day. There are over 2.3 million licensed firearms owners in Canada. We enjoy our property, our culture, our passion safely without issue. That deserves to be celebrated. National Range Day is an opportunity for all Canadians to learn and participate in any of the hundreds of events happening in almost every community across the country. Sports shooters, collectors, recreational shooters, and hunters alike will host the country by opening their doors and their communities to all Canadians. Find an event near you at nationalrangeday.ca. As co-chair of the Parliamentary Outdoor Caucus, I am proud to support the millions of Canadians who responsibly, legally, safely own and use firearms. 
I hope more to get to know the positives of Canada's firearms cu culture, and I'm excited for more Canadians to get to know the sport. Remember, this June 4th is National Range Day. I hope to see you there. The Honourable Member for Windsor Tecumseh. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to rise in the House and declare we are bringing back the third shift at Windsor Assembly. Last week, I had the privilege of hosting the Prime Minister in my community to announce a historic $3.7 billion investment with Stellantis to restore all three shifts in Windsor and Brampton. This is a great day for auto workers, Mr. Speaker. Auto workers who are the heartbeat of our community. And when auto thrives, our community thrives. From working families to restaurants and small businesses, young people, Mr. Speaker, now have thousands of good paying jobs and a bright future here at home. Mr. Speaker, this investment plus last month's record battery plant announcement means thousands of new jobs in Windsor to come see. Our government has invested more in Windsor auto workers than any government in Canada's history. And together, we are building not just batteries and electric vehicles, Mr. Speaker. We are building a strong, prosperous, and zero-emission Canada. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, Pastor Orville John Zubin, or lovingly known as Pastor OJ, was one of the great community pillars of our Edmonton Mill Woods community. Sadly, he lost his battle with cancer on Good Friday at the age of 66. He is survived by his loving wife, Barb, six children, eight grandchildren, and many relatives and friends, and a large congregation that he helped to build. Pastor OJ joined the Calvary Community Church in 1977, where he faithfully served for over 44 years. During that time, he also spent 12 years with the Edmonton Police Service, followed by many years as a business owner and 21 years as lead pastor. Under his leadership, Calvary Community Church has become an integral part of Edmonton, providing care and supporting families through the Millwoods Christian School, the Child Care Program, Millwoods Care Closet, and other community initiatives. Pastor OJ's loving and welcoming spirit drew people together, making his congregation a very diverse and loving one. Mr. Speaker, I will miss our conversations about faith, family, and community. He will be missed. Thank you. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Portneuf, Jacques Cartier. Mr. Speaker, when I was a communications student, I had the privilege of interviewing the King of Radio, André Arthur, as part of a school assignment. He was generous enough to answer my questions. He was impressively popular. He left no one indifferent. He claimed to be the defender of the poor. And this man, who was so cultured, used the French language with a master's hand and excelled in juggling with words. After criticizing politicians, he decided to d dive into political life and was elected member for Portneuf Port Jacques Cartier for nearly six years. He represented the members of this riding that I now represent. He left his mark on the world of communications with his outspokenness. An expression he liked to use, one that I like as well, is if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And I would like to offer my condolences to his children, René and Pascal, his three grandchildren, his companion Lucy and his brother Louis, and all his relatives. André Arthur, thank you for your service. Rest in peace. The Honourable Member for Alfred Pellon. Mr. Speaker, let's be grey in May. Bray is brand Brain Tumor Awareness Month. Every day, 27 Canadians will hear the words, you have a brain tumor. These tumors are unpredictable and complex and can affect anyone at any time. Whether they're malignant or benign, they leave their physical, psychological, and financial mark on the lives of patients and their loved ones. And when a loved one hears the words, you have a brain tumor, their life and that of their families is shaken. This year, brain, the Brain Tumor March is celebrating 40 years of hope. So sign up for Walk Weekend from June 17th to 19th to say goodbye to brain tumors. Register to support patients and their families. Register to recognize the resilience of survivors and to give hope. I will walk for you, Mom. Who will you walk for? 
Honorable Member for Vancouver Kingsway. I rise today to recognize National Nursing Week. This is our opportunity to thank Canada's nurses for their outstanding leadership delivering health care to all Canadians. During this pandemic, nurses made tremendous sacrifices to answer the call when we needed them most. Mm -hmm. They provided care with skill, compassion and courage in the face of unrelenting waves of COVID-19. But we know that Canada's nurses provide critical services to patients at all times in all healthcare environments. Nurses take care of us at our most vulnerable, and we must take care of them in return. This National Nursing Week, let us turn our words of gratitude into action by addressing important issues like staffing shortages, workplace violence, and unacceptable working conditions. Canadian nurses are the backbone of our healthcare system. This week, take a moment to thank them for their professionalism, skill, and dedication. I'll be doing exactly that to my sister Cheryl Davies and her partner Bob Jasperson, superb nurses for over 30 years. Mm, yeah. yeah. Here, here. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Laurentide Labelle. Mr. Speaker, many Bloc supporters participated in our party's fundraising campaign for Ukraine. On behalf of all of our members, I would like to warmly thank each person who contributed to the $35,000 fund that we gave to the Red Cross. That $35,000 will become $70,000 as the federal government is matching donations. Obviously, it will take more to overcome the horror that we are helplessly witnessing in Ukraine. But in the face of discouragement, I salute the people who have chosen to do their part. I also invite the other federal parties to do their share. The Bloc is only active in Quebec. The other parties have networks throughout the Maritimes, Ontario, the Prairies and the West. They could easily dwarf the amount of money the Bloc has raised, and I hope they do so. After, after 75 days of war, every effort is needed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just remind folks, as we just before we get get there, we got a, still got a couple of statements to do. Uh, the honourable member for Brantford Brant. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, recently the Justice Committee heard the testimony from Robert Davis, the chief of the Brantford Police Service. During his testimony, Chief Davis said, and I quote: "With Bill C-5 and the proposed changes now, we are going to see sentencing become a joke. With turning sentences into conditional sentences, the justice system will be brought into disrepute." People will operate with impunity. Victims' rights are going to be given away for the rights of the criminal. Victims of communities will live in fear of gun violence, fearful of retaliation by armed criminals, and people will continue to overdose. Chief Davis is a proud Mohawk from the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory in my riding of Brantford Brant. He's been policing since 1990 and is the only Indigenous leader of the Municipal Police Service in Ontario. His first-hand experience debunks the ideological-driven narrative that the Liberal members are selling. Despite this, sadly and dangerously, this NDP Liberal government does not want to listen to the warnings of Chief Davis. My message is simple. The Minister of Justice must withdraw this soft on crime now. Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Sudbury. This marks the beginning of National Mining Week. The focus of Mining Week is to highlight the innovations and accomplishments made by the mining industry and showcase the ideas used to advance the industry to become more sustainable and environmentally sound. Canada's mining industry is essential to the products that we rely on as an economic driver and major employer in communities all across the country. In Northern Ontario alone, over 23,000 are employed, generating $5.5 billion in annual revenue. Mr. Speaker, I want to recognize and thank the mining industry in Canada who continue to make large strides to ensure safety is at the forefront of their operations while also working hard to enable a low-carbon future. Specifically, I would like to recognize the incredible efforts made by the Mining Association of Canada and their commitment to advocating for the mining and mining supply sector across the country. Thank you. Oral questions, Question Aral, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker 
Flooding has been affecting communities across Manitoba, particularly in my riding of Portage Lisgar. And although there was warm weather and wind this past weekend, which helped, we are hearing that there's more heavy rain in the forecast today. Resources are quickly being used up and people are exhausted. Communities are tired of being isolated and cut off from the rest of the province. Can the Minister of Emergency Preparedness tell us what, if anything, the federal government is doing to help those affected by flooding in Manitoba? The Honourable Minister of Emergency Preparedness. I want to begin by thanking the, the, the Leader of the Official Opposition for an important question. And, and we are very much engaged with the province of Manitoba and with the impacted communities. Flooding continues to affect multiple communities across the province due to high water levels on the Red River and its tributaries. Um, we have been working very closely through our Government Operations Centre and Indigenous Services Canada with the Manitoba Emergency Coordination Centre. I've reached out a number of times to my counterpart, Minister uh, Puniak. Um, we are in regular contact and we've offered every assistance that, that that Manitoba may require. So at this point in time, Manitoba advises that the flood response remains within provincial uh, capabilities, but we have also engaged with the Red Cross to assist with evacuations, and we're working with the municipalities, 26 of whom have declared states of local emergency. We'll continue to be there for the people of Manitoba. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for the answer. Speaker, the Liberals invoked the Emergencies Act without just cause, and they are now trying to cover it up. The government used extraordinary power on innocent Canadians, restricting their movement and freezing their bank accounts, and now they're trying to cover up the fact they did not need to use the Act. As Perrin Beatty, the author of the Emergencies Act, said, whenever you have extraordinary power, there must be extraordinary accountability. Where is the extraordinary accountability that Canadians deserve? What are the Liberals trying to hide when it comes to the Emergencies Act? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague for the question. The accountability comes in the professionalism and the way that the police undertook their work to restore public safety. The way in which there's accountability, Mr. Speaker, is the ongoing way in which we're being fully transparent with the events that led to the invocation of the Emergencies Act, including testimony before the, the committee and our planned cooperation with Judge Rouleau. Mr. Speaker, we invoked the Act because it was necessary, it worked, and we will continue to be transparent about this. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Speaker, the Liberals just trust us is not enough. This is the same Prime Minister that covered up his involvement in the SNC-Lavalin scandal. He covered up his involvement in the WEE scandal. He's hiding documents right now around the Winnipeg Microbiology Lab. He covers up every single scandal that he is a part of. And now he's trying to cover up the fact that he was abusing his power when he invoked the Emergency Measures Act. Why do these Liberals think Canadians should just trust them on the Emergencies Act when they continually hide, cover up and deflect. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, with respect, it, it continues to be astounding how the uh, Honourable Leader for the Opposition continues to deflect uh, her responsibility for her conduct during the Emergencies Act for the posture of the Conservative Party uh, who continue to encourage illegal blockaders to stay. And if they don't want to take it from the government, Mr. Speaker, listen to what the Canadian Association of Chiefs, uh, Chiefs of Police said. The Emergencies Act is critical to assisting law enforcement in addressing the mass, national and international organization of the so-called Freedom Convoy. The words of law enforcement, nonpartisan, professional law enforcement, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Member for Megan's Eclairable. Mr. Speaker. $2.04 a litre in Montreal, same thing in Newfoundland, $2.06 a litre in BC, and I'm only talking about regular gasoline. For 50 litres, it's over $100. A $20 top-up doesn't even move the needle on the dashboard anymore. The Liberals aren't even trying to hide it. They're happy to see prices this high. What is the Liberal NDP government waiting for? Why not give people a break? The Honourable Minister. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, as members of this House should be uniting to fight the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Conservatives are just playing petty politics. They're ignoring the facts to try to score partisan points when it comes to gas prices. 
So we, while they do that, we are going to concentrate on things that will help Canadians. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Clérable. Mr. Speaker, how much extra revenue is this government getting from taxes, uh, including the carbon tax and tax on gas? They should tell us that instead of making up excuses. The rising cost of living is making everything more expensive for workers f to buy fruits and vegetables, to transport goods. And as the Prime Minister himself said in 2018, he likes taxing people so he can pay for his spending. That's exactly what the Prime Minister said in 2018 about rising gas costs. How can the Prime Minister be happy when families are struggling so hard to make ends meet? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, this is a serious question, and Canadians deserve a discussion based on the facts, not on partisan discussion uh, speaking points. This is a world situation uh, made worse by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We're continuing to focus on ways of making life more affordable for Canadians. The Conservatives uh, keep voting against those measures. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Mr. Speaker, in a democracy, one of the most fundamental principles is no taxation without representation. No elected officials, no taxes. That's at the heart of modern democracy. The budget and the budget implementation bill are therefore essential moments in the life of a democracy. In silencing the opposition on the Budget Implementation Act, does anyone in this government realize the damage they're doing to democracy? The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's essential to have debate. But the obstruction coming from the Conservative Party day after day for four months is delaying the passage of bills like C-8. It's unacceptable, and unfortunately, we have to do our job as quickly as possible. And there will be opportunities at committee and at third reading to debate. There will be a number of many opportunities for further debate. The Honourable Member for St. Jean. Mr. Speaker, the bill that's just been muzzled is nearly 500 pages long with some 60 measures and amendments to 37 other acts. Just reading it takes longer than the time we've had to debate it. It addresses things like COVID support measures, EI, anti-Semitism, the Social Security Tribunal, and aerospace, to name but a few. Each of these issues deserves a full debate in its own right. But no, it's all being shoved down our throats. Why this denial of democracy? The Honourable Government House Leader. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For five days, we tried to get the bill through, but the problem with the Conservatives is that they're obstructing our work each and every step of the way, and that was the case for four months with C-8, and that's the case here now, too. This, There are essential things in this bill, essential to Canadians, and we are 100% sure that this bill should pass, and there will be lots of opportunities at committee and back here at the House to discuss this legislation. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, while most people are paying more to meet their basic needs, there's a nasty bunch of people who are lining their pockets. In the seven years since this government took power, Owning a first home has become virtually unattainable, and it's increasingly hard to find decent rental housing at an affordable price. The real estate market is overheating, and renovations are on the rise. Just yesterday, the federal housing advocate, Marie-Josée Houle, told us that Ottawa could curb this crisis by tackling the financialization of properties. Will the government listen to her, the Honourable Minister of Housing? Thank you, Mr. Speaker opportunity to uh, agree with the honourable member that we need to support renters uh, throughout Canada. Uh, we are the government that introduced uh, the Canada Housing Benefit and in Budget 2022 we are adding more investments in that program with a top up of $500 on average to vulnerable renters. Uh, this adds to the over $2,500 on average that we provide to the most vulnerable members of our community who need help with rents. Merci beaucoup. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Canada's housing crisis is 
been escalated by those using the housing market to make huge profits. The largest 25 financial landlords hold nearly 20 percent of the country's private rentals. For every one affordable housing unit built, 15 are taken up by investors making money on the backs of Canadians. It is time to stop treating housing as a stock market. Will the government stop corporate landlords from buying up affordable housing and help nonprofits purchase them for Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Housing. I agree with the Honourable Member that we need to build more rental housing in Canada. That's why, as part of the National Housing Strategy, we have the Rental Construction Financing Initiative, a program that has increased uh, so many times over the last number of budgets because we recognize that as a government we have a responsibility to build the next generation of affordable rental units across the country. In addition to that, while we're building more rents, we introduced the Canada Housing Benefit, which we're topping up in Budget 2022. So uh, we agree that we need to tackle speculation. We agree that we need to build more rental housing, and that's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, millennials were told that if they got a bunch of degrees, a skilled trade, a good job, they'd have no problem owning a home. Yet they still live in their parents' basement. The government's signature housing promise to solve this is a new savings account, but you need $8,000 a year in savings to use it. To add insult to injury, the government says that they'll give you $500 towards a house you can't afford. Wow. And that's not a typo. The more they do, the worse it gets. When will the minister actually help anybody in this home, in this country, buy a home? The Honourable Minister of Housing. It's really difficult to take that member seriously on this issue because she claimed in this house that we will not build a single affordable home in her region this year. When we know that the National Housing Strategy's Rapid Housing Initiative alone has built 10,250 permanent affordable homes, Mr. Speaker, including in her region. So it's really difficult to deal with misinformation and disinformation and talking down our housing market every single day from that side of the house. I know everybody's are really anxious to get, uh, you know, they've been away for the weekend, excited to come back. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, it used to be thought here in Canada that if you worked hard, made good choices and saved, you could be a homeowner. But under this Liberal government, housing prices have increased 100%. Millennials and working Canadians have watched the dream of home ownership slip through their fingers. Never has a government spent so much and congratulated themselves more while doing so much damage to the dreams of Canadians. When will the Liberals climb down from their ivory tower, admit their policies have failed, and fix the broken housing system they've created? The Honourable Minister of Housing. I wish the Honourable Member would save that uh, energy and enthusiasm and advocacy in his own caucus. Because one day they ask us to move away from investments uh, in housing and walk away uh, and leave that money to provinces. Another time they say that we shouldn't help first-time homebuyers. In another instance they are against the foreign ban uh, on, on ownership of Canadian residential real estate. They talk down investments in affordable housing. They don't give any credit to the Canada Housing Benefit, a program that is helping tens of thousands of Canadians to pay the rent, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2015, this government was elected on a promise to make housing affordable. But since then, the average Canadian house price has increased by 100%, and in Aurelia, it's up 300%. This government's solution is to throw a few more billion dollars at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> but the shiny new tax-free home savings account won't be available for at least one year. Then you have to spend five years to deposit enough money to max out the program. Help is six years away, not today. This government is abandoning young people on housing. Why? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Housing. Speaker, that is absolutely not true. The just in one uh, instance through the Housing Accelerator Fund, we are putting on the table $4 billion to work with municipalities to increase housing supply. We know that supply is a big part of the uh, challenge facing Canada. Canada has one of the fastest growing populations in the G7 countries, but our housing supply hasn't kept up with that. We are also helping first-time home buyers, and we're making sure that we crack down on speculation and unfair uh, 
practices in the real estate sector. On top of that, we're doubling down and investing more in affordable housing. The Honourable Member for Kenora. Mr. Speaker, the dream of home ownership is being stolen from my generation as now 80% of young Canadians don't believe that they'll ever be able to afford a home. Mr. Speaker, they don't need a, a few hundred bucks from the government. They don't need a new savings account. They need a plan to address the real issues like the lack of housing supply. Mr. Speaker, over the last seven years, this government has failed to incentivize enough development, creating this housing crisis. So why should Canadians believe that this minister is going to get the job done That's a great this question. time? Great question. The Honourable Minister of Housing. Speaker, the Honourable Member talks about housing supply, yet that party, including himself, voted against the first stage of investments in the Housing Accelerator Fund, a program that single-handedly will deliver 100,000 new housing supply across the country. They vote against investments in co-ops, in rapid housing initiative, in making sure that we reinvest even more money in the Canada Housing Benefit, bringing forward money in the National Housing Co-Investment Fund to build 22,000 permanently affordable homes, and the Housing Accelerator Fund and also the Innovation Fund. Merci beaucoup. So much good news. The Honourable Member for Mission Masque Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, despite all of the government's rhetoric, the reality is that a price of a home continues to be unattainable for many young families. Yeah. You just got to admit you failed. Now they said they're going to address housing supply, yet they excluded any measure in the Budget Implementation Act to address housing supply. Exactly. When will this government realize that promises and empty rhetoric don't build houses? Yeah. Yeah. Just need to remember. Just need to remember members to, to address the chair and not directly to the member. The Honourable Minister of Housing. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member from Mission Matsqui, Fraser Canyon, is on record as saying that we should walk away. We should walk away from our leadership role and investments in affordable housing and just leave it to the provinces. That's the leadership that he's suggesting. Instead, he talks about housing supply. We are dedicated to housing supply through the Housing Accelerator Fund, 100,000 new homes, and making permanent sustainable changes in permitting, zoning, and intensification and infrastructure to make sure we build more housing for the future. The Honourable Member for Port Neuf, Jacques Cartier. Mr. Speaker, this government seems to think everything's fine. Inflation is at its highest in the past 30 years. The deficit, deficit is gigantic. Immigration is extremely deficient. And the dream of young Canadians of having access to property is currently impossible. What's this government going to do to allow our young people to believe in a future that includes home ownership? Not in 10 years, not in five years, now. Well, the, minister. the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Conservatives continue to denigrate uh, Canadians with uh, economic falsehoods, but the data shows that our GDP has gone up by 5.6% in recent years, and the IMF recently forecast that Canada would have the highest growth rate in the G7. Mr. Speaker, we are here to make life more affordable for Canadians. Our economy is growing strong, and Canadians can be proud of that. The Honourable Member for salaberry sur -Ois. Mr. Speaker, last Friday, Camille Lorrain, father of the Charter of the French Language, would have been 100 years old. On that occasion, the ministers responsible for the French language over the past 30 years from all parties wrote that constant action, quote unquote, must be taken to protect French. That is proof that French is in danger. C-13 will entrench institutional bilingualism. C-13 will allow federal companies to use French or English. That's not what Quebecers want, Mr. Speaker. Why does Ottawa continue to undermine Quebec and the protection of French? The Honourable Minister of Official Languages. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. As a woman from New Brunswick, 
uh, who has visited minority language communities, I understand the importance of protecting French all across Canada, including in Quebec, because French is in decline. And that is why we have a new version of the legislation to go even further in protecting our rights as Francophones from coast to coast to coast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for salaberry sur -Roi. Mr. Speaker, it's French that's in decline in Quebec, not English. It's French that needs protecting, not bil bilingualism. C-13 prevents Quebec from imposing the charter of the French language and instead offers federally regulated companies a choice. The choice between French and the pan-Canadian bilingual model, the same model that inspires Air Canada and CN, two federal companies operating in Quebec who are required to offer services in French and, in spite of everything, really don't care about francophones. Is this really the model that should be spread across Quebec? If so, it's unacceptable. The Honourable Minister of Official Languages. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'm not here to play politics. I'm here to protect and promote French all across the country, including in Quebec. We've been crystal clear, Mr. Speaker, the decline of French is occurring everywhere in Canada, including in Quebec. So we're working very hard with a new version of the bill, C-13, to protect and promote the rights of Francophones all across the country. And I hope the Bloc will work with us to ensure that that bill passes because it will make a real difference for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, with their new bill, C-13, the Liberals are rejecting the distinctiveness of French in a sea of hundreds of millions of Anglophones. They're preventing Quebec from imposing the charter of the, language, of the French language on federally regulated businesses. They're not protecting French, they're protecting bilingualism. And bi bilingualism is in no danger in Quebec because English is not threatened. Bilingualism is doing so well that it's actually displacing French as the common language. Does the minister realize that C-13 does not protect French in Quebec? It rather promotes Quebec's anglicization, the Honourable Minister. What I do know is that those members opposite haven't read the bill in its entirety. We're doing everything to protect French, not just in Quebec, but all across Canada. And I have to say, as a Francophone who lives in New Brunswick and having visited minority language communities, I take exception to the question that was asked by the member opposite, because once again, it's my daily job to protect French. The Honourable Member for Salisbury, White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We know that our Special Forces King Air Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Platform was monitoring the truckers' convoy protest on Parliament Hill. The Prime Minister has called it a training flight. If the government was prepared to send up ISR aircraft over the protest, what was it doing to gather intelligence on the ground? Because one doesn't engage one without the other. My question is, what was the coordination between public safety Safety, National Defence, Canadian Forces, Privy Council, and the Prime Minister's office during the protest. The Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reiterate what the Prime Minister said last week a number of times for my honourable colleague's benefit. The flight in question was part of a Canadian Armed Force training exercise that was planned prior to and was unrelated to the convoy protest. The training had nothing to do with the convoy blockade, Mr. Speaker, and we'll continue to reiterate that fact. Thank you. The Honourable Member for, uh, we'll do this again, South Surrey White Rock. Mr. Speaker, we know a Special Forces surveillance flight took place. We know the government even let the health agency spy on Canadians' liquor habits during oh. COVID. The Prime Minister has called it a training exercise. What does the government think an ISR does for training? Just fly around in circles? It gathers intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance over that target. And that target clearly was the protest. Two questions. Who is that reconnaissance platform? reporting to when gathering intelligence on Canadians, and what special policing authorities were granted to Canadian forces at that time? Good question. The Honourable Minister of National Defence. 
Mr. Speaker, I'd like to reiterate that the assumptions underlining that question are misguided. Again, the Canadian Armed Forces flight was part of a training exercise. The exercise was planned prior to and was unrelated to the presence of the protesters and the convoy. The opposition doesn't seem to appreciate or like this point, Mr. Speaker, but it is the truth. Thank you. Order. Order. The Honourable Member for Charles Le Bourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, the Defence Minister has said that this was planned long before the convoy, but the operations lasted four days. There was cell phone communication, and the question is simple. Was the information gathered, did that serve the government, or was it destroyed? <laughs> the Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, as I've already said in English, the flight in question was part of a training exercise. The Canadian Armed Forces conducted that exercise. The training had nothing to do with the convoy, and that's the fact. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, abortion and reproductive health services are not accessible across the country. Women, particularly in northern and rural communities, are forced to drive for hours to access essential health care services. Last year, the government promised $45 million for sexual and reproductive health fund. But providers have not seen a single dollar for these essential services. It's not good enough for the government to say the right things. They must increase ex accessibility now. When will the government actually deliver the promised funding for abortion and health services in Canada? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very glad to hear this question, Mr. Speaker, because defending the rights of women here in Canada and across Canada is absolutely essential. We'll be there every step of the way to do that, and I look forward to making further announcements. I ask my colleague to be watching closely for soon-to-be news on that particular front. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. Well, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to delivering help to oil and gas companies, this, this uh, government is far better than it is for women who are looking for health services. While the price of gas soars, Imperial Oil is making its highest profit in 30 years, Sanovis saw its profits increase sevenfold. This isn't just about companies passing along higher costs to consumers, this is about them taking home more profit on every litre sold. Not only are the Liberals not doing anything to stop that price gouging, but they're also continuing to throw public money at companies like these that are already taking advantage of Canadians. So when are they going to end public subsidies to oil and gas companies who are already making record profits? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Member knows very well, this government has committed to phasing out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, and we are in the process of working through that now. We have been working, though, with all sectors of the economy, including the oil and gas sector, but including the steel sector, the aluminum sector, and others, to ensure that they are able to reduce their emissions in line with uh, what is required to achieve our targets and achieve the commitments we've made to the international community while growing a, uh, a strong and healthy economy that creates jobs and economic opportunity for Canadians going forward. That is exactly what we are doing. The Honourable Member for Northwest Territories. Mr. Speaker, today is National Indigenous Nurses Day. Indigenous nurses play an integral role in society for Indigenous people in Canada and for Canadians nat nationwide. By having nurses of First Nations, Inuit and Métis ancestry, they help ensure that communities have someone who understands the importance of culture in healing and who is familiar with the health care system. Can the Minister of Indigenous Services please, co please comment on the significant role that Indigenous nurses serve in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister, Minister of Indigenous Services. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague from the Northwest Territories for his unwavering advocacy for the health of people in Northwest Territories. Nurses have always been the backbone of our health care system, and I think we can all say a huge thank you to the efforts of nurses, especially through the pandemic. They've put up so, such an effort to protect us all, and they've been unwavering in their commitment. For over 47 years, the Canadian Indigenous 
Indigenous Nurses Association has been a leader in supporting Indigenous nurses and improving Indigenous health. And we're supporting their efforts by investing in programs to recruit and support Indigenous students in healthcare across Canada. I'm thrilled to welcome the Canadian Indigenous Nurses Association today and applaud them for their work. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Les délais dans les traitements. Mr. Speaker, the delays in processing passport applications are completely unacceptable. Here's a few comments from citizens about Service Canada. It was chaos, abominable service. I had to cancel my trip. And yet, this government already has the solution to all of these problems. Allow employees to return to work in person at Service Canada passport offices. What is it waiting for to recall this employees of the state? General Minister of Families. I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for the question. I understand the frustration of Canadians. This situation is very frustrating. We are experiencing an incredible increase in passport applications. However, this week, all passport offices are open, people are back at work, and they are working overtime during the evening and over the weekend to ensure that we can serve Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Peterborough Kawartha. Well, you knew. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they knew. A report from October 2021 states that the government was bracing for a surge of passport applications. Well, fast forward seven months later and clearly they didn't brace well enough. Wait times have become so outrageous that people are offering a service to wait in line for passport renewals. One of my constituents was recommended by Service Canada to line up at 1 a.m. Constituents are also being charged extra processing fees, meaning a $160 10-year passport is now costing Canadians $315. So if the Liberals knew, why are Canadians paying the price for the Liberals' inability to prepare? The Honourable Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I've mentioned many times in this uh, House, we are experiencing an unprecedented increase in the demand for passports. After two years, Canadians Canadians understandably would like to travel again, but that means that when everyone is applying at the same time, it is a lot for the system to handle. That being said, we have ensured that we have hired additional people. We have opened on evenings, on weekends. In fact, this past weekend, 12 centres were open again servicing folks, and we've ensured that every wicket will now be open in passport offices to make sure that we're serving Canadians as best as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Prince George, Peace River, Northern Rockies. Mr. Speaker, the passport process has become a nightmare to thousands of Canadians. Tyler and Ira from Dawson Creek, through no fault of their own, had to travel 14 hours and spend hundreds of dollars to get their passport just hours before their trip. What used to be a simple task of completing the passport form is now causing sleepless nights, unnecessary stress and huge expense to those who just want a break from the past two years of this Prime Minister's lockdowns. When will the Minister end the, end the nightmare? Here, 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 here. The Honourable Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. Mr. Speaker, and as I've said, we certainly understand that this is very frustrating for Canadians, but when we have people who are uh, all asking to renew a passport at the same time, those are unprecedented. We did ensure that we had hired 500 additional passport officers ahead of time. We've changed it so that 303 service Canada... Order! The Honourable Minister, maybe he wants to restart that question. The Honourable Minister of Ch uh, Families, Children and Social Development. Speaker, as I said, I understand this is frustrating for Canadians and after two years of staying home, Canadians want to travel. However, when everyone is applying at the same time, that is an unprecedented volume that's happening. We have, to accommodate this, hired 500 additional passport officers, enabled Canadians to apply not just at passport offices but at the 303 Service Canada's across the country. We've also also opened passport offices through the evenings into the weekends. We opened 12 centres over the weekend. People are working overtime. They're doing everything they can because at the end of the day, Service Canada employees want to service Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon West. Mr. Speaker, last week the Minister bragged about her visit to the Saskatoon Out-of-Service Canada office. And yet, after her visit, 
the daughter of my consistent constituent, Victoria, still can't get a ca the passport because, get this, they lost her birth certificate. By contrast, the Bangladeshi High Commission sent six people to Saskatoon on the weekend and they processed 800 passports in two days. So, Mr. Speaker, how is it that a foreign government can get more done in two days than this minister can in two months? The Honourable Minister. Speaker. I just want to say to the people working at Service Canada who have been working overtime weekends to do everything that they can to service Canadians, thank you, because they are under extreme stress because of the overwhelming volume of passports that they are working really hard to process. And I know I visited the folks at Service Canada in Saskatoon and they spoke about the good working relationship that they have with that Member of Parliament. And so at no point would I ever want to disparage the incredibly hard public servants that are working around the clock to serve Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The wave of gun violence continued on Saturday night. Two shootings took the life of one man and injured five people in Laval and Montreal. And while those shots rang out in the region of Montérégie, the laughter of outlaw motorcycle gangs was louder. There were 400 hells partying, 400 of them laughing at the federal government's inaction on gun trafficking and its inability to crack down on members of criminal groups. We're fed up. Isn't it time to create a registry of criminal organizations to crack down on them? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. First of all, my condolences to the victim of this tragedy. We have invested significant amounts, including $4 million, into the RCMP to fight trafficking, $15 million for tracing, and $20 million for border services to stop illegal weapons. Nearly a month ago, I went to Montreal and I met with the mayor to take more concrete action. On this side, we fully understand the problem of firearms and we want to work with all of our partners to address it. They're spending money to find ways not to do anything. We need a registry. When an organization is listed on the registry and it can be proven that an individual is part of it, the offense is committed. No more 400-person hell's parties, no more intimidation and shows of force. If you're part of a criminal organization and you brag about it, you end up in the backseat of a police car. It's that simple. While Montreal's awash with illegal weapons that are killing people week after week, isn't the government tired of watching the thugs party on TV? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. I agree entirely with my colleague. That's why we are taking real measures. That's why we introduced a ban in order to stop AR-15s and other prohibited weapons. That's why we're investing in Montreal, in Quebec, working with the mayor of Montreal to protect youth, to protect everybody at risk. We'll do even, and we're looking forward to working with the Bloc and every other party in this House. St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, when I say arrive can, what words come to mind? <laughs> Unreliable, frustrating, ageist, broken. Useless. These are just some, yes, painful. These are just some of the words constituents of mine have used. And the app is so difficult that some seniors are having to cancel trips to funerals, weddings, birth of grandchildren. They're facing massive fines, mandatory quarantine, all because of a government app. Mr. Speaker. And after two long years, seniors in this country deserve a lot better from this government. And it's time to end the mandatory use of the loathsome ArriveCan app and allow Canadians to travel freely once again. What are the Liberals waiting for, Mr. Speaker? Great question. The Honourable Minister of Public Security. I, I appreciate my, my colleagues' concerns with regards to ArriveCan, and of course we work with the CBSA to ensure that as an application uh, it is smooth, is, it is efficient, but there are also other words to attribute uh, to ArriveCan, which is that it's an important tool to protect Canadians, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to ensure that we work with my honourable colleague, along with all other communities, to ensure that trade and travel continue to increase, make sure our economy is going again. That's what our goal is, and that's what we will continue to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
The Honourable Member for South Shore, St. Margaret's. Mr. Speaker, Gail and John from the South Shore of Nova Scotia were refused entry into Canada from their return from Florida in spite of having vaccine proof and their passports. These Canadians were denied entry because they had not filled out the No Arrive Cam NAP. Like many Canadians, they do not have smartphones. Canadians are being hoisted on this government's phone petard. Why is this government not allowing Canadians to come home if they don't have a smartphone? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, as I said to my honourable colleague last week during this uh, question period, uh, we're prepared to work with him and other members of the chamber to ensure that Arrive Can is smooth, is efficient. Uh, we're open to receiving feedback. We're not only working with members opposite, we're working with members on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. The reason we introduced the app was to protect Canadians. And of course, now that trade and travel are going again, we'll see more individuals come at the border and that their experience is, is consistent with best practices of the CBSA. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, if the government f could just for once be aware of the problems that it needs to deal with, the problems for all Canadians, not just those who have smartphones, but uh, all Canadians. Arrive can causes problems. There are problems to entry for people who answered correctly, but also those who don't have access to an iPhone. Could the government please take into account that not everyone, as the member for Louis Hébert, who has access to a computer all the time, could the government please develop a program or project that works for all Canadians? The Honourable Minister. As I've already said many times now, we are working with Border Services to reinforce access at the border to address all the challenges with this program. Since the beginning of the pandemic, our government has emphasized the health and safety of Canadians by relying on mo most recent scientific data. Since the beginning of the pandemic, border measures have remained adaptable and guided by science and prudence. Well, member for London West. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we know that the pandemic has disproportionately affected women, especially millennial women and girls. Uh, this is much more uh, true for women and girls in the Global South for whom the pandemic has reserved decades of hard um, work in the development gains. Can the Minister of International Development tell us how Canada is going to ensure that all women, adolescents and children not only survive this pandemic but thrive? The Honourable Minister of International Development. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for this very important question. Our government's commitment to women's health has been a long-standing priority. That is why I recently announced $40 million in additional funding to support the Global Financing Facilities Reclaim the Games campaign, bringing Canada's total contribution to $190 million. Now, these funds will help lower-income countries to improve the resilience of their health systems and reverse the impact of COVID-19, because Canada sees the GFF as a critical partner for strengthening country-led health systems and for reinforcing sexual and reproductive health rights um, as core components of the health care systems. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. America. Canadian farmers feed the world, but the Liberals are crippling our egg sector. From increasing regulatory burden, the carbon tax, opposition to much-needed tax reform, pushing for the displacement of meat, and the talk of mandated reductions in things like fertilizer. Canadian farmers are facing the full brunt of a leftist ideological crusade. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, why is this government sandbagging the family family farms and ranches in Canada. Will this minister today commit to scrapping her proposed nitrogen fertilizer mandated reductions? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Once again, I want to reassure you that we're working closely with representatives of different agricultural sectors in order to find out the ways that we can help them to face the cost of inputs which are very high this year. That's one of the reasons we made improvements to the Advanced Payments Program.
The Honourable Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Well, regardless of the answer, uh, whatever, regardless of the language, there wasn't an answer there. So, on, on January 24th, 2022, the Minister of Transportation affirmed that VIA would be back to full operations. However, it appears that promise is broken, as the VIA Route 3, 651 is not being put back to rest restoration, and they won't even tell us when. Mr. Speaker, when will, when will uh, Route 651 be fully restored? Here, when? Here, here. when? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, let me share with the Honourable Colleague and all Canadians the excellent news. We are investing in VIA to increase transportation, public transportation for Canadians. One of the largest investments in Canada's history is the high frequency rail that's going to connect Quebec and Ontario. And we are also investing in other routes in the country. Mr. Speaker, we are committed to supporting rail across the country, either through Infrastructure Canada or Transportation Canada. We look forward to working with our colleagues on delivering on that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coast of Bay, Central Notre Dame. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Salmon anglers throughout Newfoundland and Labrador are expressing their concerns about inadequate enforcement on our rivers. The Minister has had this brought to her attention, and it's now decision time. She knows what's in her mandate letter, and it's about protecting Atlantic salmon. Will she commit to adding extra weeks to the River Guardian program? Or will she continue to neglect Atlantic salmon stocks? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And our goal is the conservation of stocks of all kinds on both the East Coast and the West Coast. The Department of Fisheries and Oceans works with Guardian programs and their conservation and protection officers to be available and ensure that the rules are followed. And we will continue to do that, as well as work with Indigenous gardens, guardians <clears throat> more and more uh, to do this very important work. Thank you. Mr. Speaker. The last two years have shown us that businesses have to adapt to a digital economy if they want to grow. Post-secondary institutions have a key role to play in this transformation as they engage in innovative research and train students for these new jobs of the future. Could the minister responsible for ECOA tell the House how this government is preparing workers for the jobs of tomorrow, supporting business growth, and attracting investments to New Brunswick. The Honourable Minister for ACOA. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Acadie Bathurst. New Brunswick can play a major role in our digital transformation. Last week, our government announced investments worth nearly $4 million in the University of Moncton and the University of New Brunswick. These investments will help students across New Brunswick improve their skills and gain valuable industry connections and experience. Our government is helping drive economic growth across New Brunswick and Atlantic Canada and making sure everyone can benefit from the digital economy. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Speaker, this past weekend, the ice and river rose dangerously high against the dike wall at Kishetchewan. People in Kishetchewan and Fort Albany were scrambling to get planes in order to get families to safety. Now, the government knows that the dike wall is at risk of a catastrophic failure, and yet every spring they gamble with people's lives. An agreement was signed to move the people to higher ground, and yet they are still on the floodplain. So my question to the minister is simple. When will the people of Keshechewan be moved off that floodplain and moved to a safe and secure future? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister of... Emergency preparedness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and as the member knows, because we spoke a number of times and communicated over the weekend, uh, we have, in fact, uh, are, made arrangements to evacuate the people of Saskatchewan um, from the impacted area, and we are arranging for accommodation in, in a number of communities across northern Ontario. Uh, the, the planes are, are being made available um, to move people in, in a timely way, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue with that work. We're also very ably supported by, by in, uh, emergency management Ontario and people on the ground and the, and the people, the hard work of the people in Indigenous Services <coughs> Canada in support of that community. The Honourable Member for Spadina, Fort York. Mr. Speaker, it's not just gas prices that are out of control. According to a report released by the Chinese-Canadian National Council, 
There were nearly 1,000 incidents of anti-Asian hate in Canada last year. That's a 47% increase from 2020, and sadly, the upward trend will likely grow in 2022. In January, the government announced it will create a special representative on combating Islamophobia. Muslim Canadians are still waiting. In November 2021, the government reappointed a special envoy on combating anti-Semitism. As we celebrate Asian Heritage Month, will the government create a special representative to help fight Asian hate? Or, Mr. Speaker, do Asian Canadians not matter? Oh, wow. The Honourable Minister. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for, uh, for his question. Of course, we condemn all forms of hate, racism and discrimination against all Canadians from coast to coast to coast. We've seen recently a disturbing rise in anti-Asian hate and discrimination, and we stand strongly in solidarity, shoulder to shoulder, with Asian Canadians. And we have invested and we will continue to invest in community programs and organizations that are fighting hate and discrimination on the ground, including against Asian Canadians. And Mr. Speaker, today marks 20 years since the introduction of Asian Heritage Month. So to all the colleagues, happy Asian Heritage Month. And that's all the time we have for question period today. I'd like to draw your attention to some visitors we have in the gallery today. Um, we have a, a parliamentary delegation from the Kingdom of Sweden. Uh, should, be, should be accompanying him. There he is in the middle. Uh, His Excellency Dr. Andreas Nordlen, Speaker of the Parliament of the Kingdom of Sweden. And I, and I can say this was a pretty quiet question period, so Damn. thanks for being here. Uh, I'd like to return to the question of privilege uh, raised earlier today by the House Leader of the Official Opposition, if I may. Je remercie le député de... I'd like to thank the member for raising the question. Maintaining the dignity of this House 